All right, welcome everybody to this new installment of the uh, Dynamici Seminar, which also happens to be the colloquium of uh, uh, math in mathematical physics of the University of Bologna, of the math department of the University of Bologna. And uh, we are very grateful today that we have uh, Gary Freuen give us, uh, speak to us about uh, the dynamic ocean. And let me just read a, a very short bio that I've prepared since the speaker is uh, so important to us. And uh, so I wanna just give a little presentation. Okay, Gary Fronen is a professor of mathematics in the uh, School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. He's a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, the Royal Society of New South Wales and the Australian Mathematical Society. He has received many awards for both his research and his teaching, and has been the recipient of a large number of research grants on different mathematical subjects, from pure mathematics to computation and applications to industry and other scientific disciplines. So I'm uh, absolutely uh, delighted to introduce Gary Fronen to you. Gary, he, the floor is yours. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Marco and Anna, for the invitation. And thanks, Marco, for that too kind introduction. Um, so uh, I'm going to begin by showing a movie. As the title suggests, I'm talking about the dynamic ocean. This is my local ocean, uh, although this afternoon it was not quite as calm looking as, as in this photo. So let me uh, drop out of this. And now I hope you can see some kind of globe with with, uh, can you see a, a movie now? Yep. Yeah, yes we can. Uh, actually, please let, I have a few movies, so please let me know if you just, if the screen appears black or something seems strange at your end. Uh, so this is a, this is a, the colors here are speed of ocean currents and you see dominant features like the Gulf Stream over here off the east coast of the USA. You have the major equatorial currents in the Pacific you have the East Australian current running down the east coast of Australia in red, a little thin red film. Um, off the South African coast, you have the Agulhas current, and this spins off lots of little rings that you can see here. So these are eddies that I'm going to talk about later. And uh, down toward Antarctica, I'm going to start the story there. There are these, let me jump back a little bit. There are these dark blue regions where nothing much seems to happen. So this is a, a large ocean gyre. And here's another one over here. So I hope this gives you an impression that there is a lot of dynamics going on in the surface ocean, at least. This is on a log scale. The, the speeds are really, the speed difference is really enormous. Okay, so let me go back to my slides. So I want to answer four main questions and let me outline what they are. So the first one is, uh, can I find regions in the ocean where the water is recirculating for relatively long time? So these are, kind, these are fixed regions in space and the water is uh, moving about within these regions, but it's not really connected well to regions outside. So how can I find those? Uh, question two is, suppose I found one of these regions it takes a long time for water to escape. So how can I map some internal structure of these regions by mapping escape times? Question three is on the surface ocean, there are areas where the water is coming together. There are convergent zones. And uh, these are associated with, with plastic on the ocean surface. And how can we find the pathways by which water enters these convergent zones? And question four is like a spatially mobile version of question one. How do you find regions that are moving in the ocean but are not mixing well with the rest of the ocean? So I want to try and answer these questions using both models and direct observations. So what I'm going to do in the talk is answer question one or illustrate question one with uh, Antarctic gyres. And for that, I'm going to use a model uh, question two, I'm going to stick with the same gyres and use a model. Question three uh, about the garbage patches, I'm going to use both uh, a model and uh, drifter information. So observation from floating drifters in the ocean. 
And question four, I have a variety of applications. So ocean eddies, structures in the global ocean, the Gulf Stream, uh, and I'm going to use a model, I'll use floats, and I'll use also uh, information from satellites. So that's a summary of what we're going to do. So let me start with the, uh, the key uh, tool that I'm going to use, which is the transfer operator. So uh, to set this up, uh, I have a time-dependent velocity field on my domain. So X is either two or three dimensional. You should think of it as uh, if it's two dimensional, maybe it's the surface of the ocean or maybe it's a layer in the ocean. If it's three dimensional, well, it's a, it's a, a chunk, a three dimensional piece of the ocean. And so for small epsilon, I consider a very standard uh, SDE. Uh, so I have uh, my drift term and then I just have uh, Brownian motion. So what I have in mind is that the ocean currents are primarily advective and there's a small amount of diffusion, but that's happening at a relatively small scale. So this SDE, uh, if we think about its action on, on uh, mass distributions or densities, <clears throat> then their evolution is governed by the uh, advection diffusion or Fokker Planck equation. So if you're at a fixed, uh, if you have a mass distribution F and you're at a fixed and you fix space, and you say, how does that uh, density change in time? Then uh, you have a change due to the advection and a change due to the small diffusion. So solutions of this PDE, and by a solution, I mean you specify at some initial time a distribution F, and then you want to evolve that forward in time. The solutions are given by uh, applying a linear operator to that initial distribution F. And uh, this linear operator is uh, a prone Frobenius operator or more generally a transfer operator. So this, this operator, which is uh, indexed by epsilon, which is my diffusion strength, tau, which is the flow time, this will flow you from, let's say, time zero to time tau to evolve the, the density. So this linear operator transforms densities to densities. It's a positive operator. It's an integral preserving operator. And if epsilon and tau are positive, then it's a compact operator on L1 and well, L LP. So to give you a picture of what this is doing, here is a, a virtual experiment that we carried out where we initialized around the coastlines a distribution of synthetic plastic at the, at the, uh, the coastlines according to the population of each country. And then we let this uh, float away according to the ocean currents. And so if let's say F is my initial distribution of the plastic and what I'm doing is pushing it forward with the transfer operator over time and that plastic distribution changes, it's now mainly located in these regions in the, in the ocean. So I'll come back to this later and explain a little more, but I just want to indicate what this transfer operator is doing. It's evolving densities forward in time. Uh, okay, now a little uh, more about the, the spectrum because this is going to be important for us. So by the, by, the, by the positivity and the integral preservation, it has to be that the spectrum is in the unit disk in the complex plane. So here's my complex plane. This is the dotted curve is the unit disk. And here are some numerical spectral values. In fact, this is the numerical spectrum uh, for the transfer operator arising from the movie that I just showed you with, with the garbage. So if the dynamics is mixing, then you have an eigenvalue one that is uh, having multiplicity one. And the eigenfunction corresponding to that eigenvalue gives you the time asymptotic distribution of trajectories. So uh, for dynamics people, this is the invariant density. So how to interpret that is if I go back to my movie and I run this out to time infinity, this is going to converge to something and what it converges to is the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue one. In this talk, I'm mainly interested in the remaining eigenvectors. So if I order the eigenvalues by magnitude decreasing, then I have a series of eigenfunctions F2, F3, and so on. These are necessarily signed, so they have positive and negative parts. And the eigenvalue lambda 2 quantifies the slowest time asymptotic decay. And this 
leads us to uh, beginning to answer this question about which are the regions that are, that are close to uh, fixed or invariant because, okay, I take my F2, I hit it with my transfer operator and well, it just, what I get, it's an eigenfunction. So I just scale it down by, by lambda two to the tau. How the decay occurs is by positive and negative parts of F2 combining and canceling. That's, that's how the decay is working. So if I have some lambda two that is close to one and I separate my phase space into two pieces, one where my eigenfunction is negative and one where it's positive, then because I have small decay, it must be that there's little interaction between these two pieces. And so these two pieces should be close to invariant under the float. So this idea you can extend to further eigenvalues prior to uh, a gap in the spectrum, which often is not really appearing in practice, but, but that is the theory. And uh, for what I'm going to show you, I'm not going to do exactly what I'm talking about here, but I'm going to look at a finite time version of this, but I think for the purposes of this talk, you can just imagine that I'm, I'm doing something very similar to this. It is very similar to this. Okay, so let's just see. I mean, to convince you, this is not just some strange theory. Uh, here is an experiment where uh, you have a thin uh, horizontal film of fluid and you're looking down from above. And on the left, uh, you've put initially some fluorescent green dye and this fluid is being forced from below. So it has some, some kind of salt in it and you, you can magnetically force it from below and it's being, it's being periodically forced. Uh, on the right, what you see is a snapshot every period of the forcing. And what you're seeing on the right here is a convergence to this second eigenfunction F2. So you, you have your initial distribution, it's signed, Okay, my initial distribution is let's say uh, plus one here on the green and minus one on the black. And as I evolve and I take a snapshot every period, I'm converging to some complicated looking uh, eigenfunction, which, which is the F2. Now in the long run, this is an incompressible fluid. So the dynamics is area preserving. And if you go to infinity, it must be that the green is uniformly distributed. Over the, over the square. But at intermediate times, before you reach this very, very long time, at intermediate times, what you see are these patterns in, in the F2. And so these are known as strange eigenmodes, persistent patterns, and uh, they're used to find almost invariant sets. So if we want to apply this idea to the ocean, we need, we need to approximate numerically this, this transfer operator. And the way I'm going to do it is, is a fairly standard way. I have my ocean domain X and I'm going to cover it with lots of grid cells, lots of little boxes. And then I'm going to make a transition matrix between those boxes. So uh, let's say I have N, N of these boxes, N of these grid cells. And what I do is, so zooming in is one of these boxes. Zooming in, I populate it with several test points. So normally you use many more in this cartoon, I'm, I have 36, okay? And then what you do is you flow these 36 points forward for duration tau or whatever flow time you are interested in. And let's say five of them land in this box over here. So then you would say with probability five in 36, five over 36, a randomly chosen point here will move or transition to from this box to this box. And so you do this for all pairs of boxes and you construct a stochastic transition matrix. Now this is a very big matrix, but it's also very sparse because most of the entries are zero. Most of the transition probabilities have no chance of occurring. Okay, so now uh, to, the, to the ocean. So this is uh, now getting to question one. Um, actually, can I ask, uh, Anna, do you see a bar across the top or do you see a, a title? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I see a title. Oh, good, good. Okay. I see a bar, but if you see a title, that's good. I, I read Antarctic Gyres or Giants. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So uh, in this cartoon, you see this, uh, you see, I don't know if you can read this, this says Weddell G, G for Gyre. So this is the Weddell Gyre off the Antarctic coast. 
and this is the Ross Gyre off the Antarctic coast. So these are these are cyclonic gyres. Uh, they're driven by the wind and the thermohaline uh, circulation in the ocean, and um, they're important for stirring up the ocean. They're important for the physics, the biogeochemistry of the ocean, and also for pumping uh, lots of uh, carbon down into the deep ocean. So what we would like to do is, I, the dynamics of these gyres is basically the water in some sense just goes around and around and it, it escapes very rarely. So these are examples of these almost invariant sets that I've been mentioning. So this, this gyre is dynamically disconnected from the surrounding water and what we would like to do is map, map the extent of the gyre. Okay, um, so there are uh, seasonal effects to these gyres. So the winds, for example, they're wind driven and the winds strengthen in the, in the winter. And traditionally these have been uh, estimated by sea surface height. So, so there's some physics that says that um, the, at the, the, gyre, the sea surface height will tend to bulge up or dip down depending on which way they rotate. And you can use satellite tracks. So satellites will track across the earth, above the earth, and they can estimate uh, by altimetry, by sending beams to the ocean and getting reflected, they can estimate pretty accurately the height of the ocean. And so you can use this to estimate the, uh, the, the boundary of the gyre. Uh, but we showed in this paper that actually this is already uh, suboptimal. You can already do much better with these transfer operator ideas. And what I want to do here is, is do it in three dimensions, which is something that you, you cannot do with satellites because they can only see the surface. And we also want to see how these change with the seasons. So uh, what we do is we take this model. So it's uh, called Orca 025. So the 025 is for one quarter. So one quarter degree means every grid cell on the model, uh, it is one quarter longitude by one quarter latitude big. That's the resolution of the model. And we, we use a one year flow over this year. We discretize the, the 3D, um, Oh, I should say it has 46 depth layers. So it goes from the surface down to the sea floor. It's got 46 uh, layers vertically. We discretize this 3D domain into 140,000 boxes. We, we sample 500 test points per box. And then for each season, we flow for three months. And then we compute uh, the, the leading eigenvectors. So already in this picture, I've, I've computed an eigenvector. And you can see that the blue, the extreme, so blue is like minus one, red is plus one. You can see the blue is roughly where Weddell is, the red is roughly where, where the Ross gyre is. And in the later pictures I'm going to show you, what, I'm, what I will do is I will take a level set uh, of, the, of this picture. So I will, I will select, I will scan through several level sets of, of colors and I will pick the level set that gives me the boundary that, that minimizes the water leakage. So I'm going to optimize over the level sets. It's just a line search. And then I cut away the rest of the water. So in this picture, I've already done that. For each season, for summer, autumn, winter, and spring, I've already done this, this, uh, this level set optimization. I've cut away the rest of the water. And so this is our estimate looking down from the surface of the Weddell Gyre and Ross Gyre in summer, autumn, winter, and spring. Uh, more interesting is what happens in 3D. So this is in 3D now. Um, let me orient you. So latitude, so into the page is toward the equator. Uh, east and west are how they usually are. So west is to the left, east is to the right. And this is the ocean surface and this is the ocean floor at the bottom. And this is the Weddell gyre on the right and the Ross gyre on the left. And you can compute some statistics pretty easily. So, so you get about 92, 93% of the water that is initialized in these gyres remaining in the gyre for the three months that you float. Okay, so that's summer. This is autumn. So you see a pretty dramatic change in autumn. The, the Weddell gyre gets much shallower. This is winter, they're both kind of shallow. And then in spring, the Weddell uh, deepens again uh, to, to begin the cycle, uh, the annual cycle again. So uh, in summary, we, we had a, a pretty large three-dimensional domain in the ocean over the, south, over the South Pole. And we asked the question, which are the objects that are most invariant in that domain? 
And what we found was that these two gyres are the most invariant objects. And in that way, we were able to extract the objects using this idea of most invariant or least leaky. So can we now say more about the internal structure of the gyres? And this brings me to my second question. So these are not invariant sets, they're close to invariant. I had, uh, here I have 92% of the water remaining after three months. So that means that 8% went out, 8% escaped. So how long do particles remain inside before they escape? So the transfer operator gives you a simple expression for this. So let, uh, let G be uh, the three-dimensional object that is the gyre. That's a subset of your domain and that's a subset of R3. And let calligraphic I be the, the indices of all the boxes that make up the gyre, all the little boxes in my, in my grid. So what I would like is for each box, I would like to know the expected time that a water particle initialized in that box takes to escape from the gyre. And uh, this is what you should do to, so there's a linear expression, a linear equation that you should solve. So this is, this is well known in, in Marco chain theory. Uh, this is the identity matrix. This is the transition matrix restricted to the, to the indices that make up the gyre. This is your variable T that you want to solve for. And this is a vector of ones. The same expression is true at the level of operators. So you could write T as a function of, of space is the identity operator minus the transfer operator appropriately restricted. And this is the indicator function on G. So, uh, okay, this is being recorded. So here, here's the proof that, that this is what you need to do. Um, you can find this in many Markov chain books. I just put it here uh, if you want to come back and, and have a look at it, but I don't go through it right now. So uh, to the results, um, here is what, what I've done is take the Weddell gyre. Now this is again, summer, autumn, winter, and spring. And I've taken a vertical slice through the middle of the Weddell gyre. And the color code is the time it takes a water particle to escape. So the color scale was down here. So blue, this dark blue is about eight years. And the green, is about, uh, let's say two years. So as you might expect, if you're near the, near the edge, the edge of the gyre, you escape more quickly. Interestingly, in autumn and winter where you had these shallow gyres, so it looked like the gyre was smaller, so maybe you think it's weaker, but actually it has a stronger core. So toward the, the middle, the core of the gyre, you can last uh, 10, 11 years, even though the gyre itself is, is smaller. So this gives you some information about the internal structure of the gyres. And I'm um, just mentioning here that this was all done with a model, but uh, in some more recent work, we did these kind of calculations directly from, uh, from floats. So this was at, at, a, at a depth layer, at a horizontal depth layer, and we, we built this transition matrix from floats. All right, uh, so this brings me to question three. And now this is about uh, the, the convergence zones and the plastic. So this is the movie I showed before. Why do you have this convergence in these zones here? Well, this, these are known regions where water is, is coming together on the ocean surface and water is incompressible. So if water is coming together on the surface, it, has, it must then descend. It must go below the surface and down well. But the plastic is floating and so the plastic cannot down well with the water and so it just accumulates on the surface in these areas. And so you, you get these uh, areas of accumulation and maybe you saw in the news that you have these garbage patches that appear in certain areas. The, the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is one you hear about a lot. Um, oh, I should say we, we built this that not from a model but uh, from drifters. So there, there's a large array of drifters and and by following the drifters, we could build the transition matrix directly from, from the data. Uh, now, what, is the, what does the plastic look like? It's not like mountains of plastic or you know, plastic uh, bottles or things like that. It's usually uh, tiny pieces of plastic, even smaller than you see in this picture. And the tiny pieces, they're broken down by, by the sun and the, the waves. And it's also not particularly thick with plastic. So it's like a thin soup of plastic. Um, but just because they're small, this is not so good because they're, they're small, the, the marine animals can eat them very easily. And ultimately they come up the food chain to us. 
And uh, because it's so thin um, and, and uh, small, uh, it's very hard to remove. So um, we should definitely stop putting more plastic in the ocean. That is the fastest way to stop the problem. Uh, now I want to switch to a model. Uh, so I'm using this ocean uh, GCM is global circulation model. Uh, this is a finer resolution, so it's 10th degree grid, 10th degree longitude by latitude. And it's forced with winds because the winds are very important for the surface flow. So we want to get the winds correct. And this is just on the surface. So we have a 2D domain. We discretize what you see here into 10,000 boxes um, into uh, two by two degrees. We, we initialize with 100 particles and then we integrate them for a year. And we build our transition matrix. And so now here, instead of in the previous movie, I started with the garbage at the, the coastline, but now I just have a uniform distribution of whatever, let's just say water, let's say. And this is how the distribution evolves after two years, 10 years, 100 years, and 1,000 years. And you see the water is accumulating or whatever you like is accumulating on the surface uh, in, in about the same positions as you saw in the previous movie. So how we make these, these pictures is very straightforward. To make this 1,000 year picture, all we do is we take the, the, the vector one, which represents a uniform distribution, and we multiply it 1,000 times with the transition matrix. Now for dynamics people, this is a bit weird because you integrated the year 2001, but oceanographers think this is uh, pretty okay. Uh, they're often doing these annual mean flows and uh, so this is, this is not too bad from an oceanographer's point of view. Okay, now uh, each garbage patch is a sink, as I've pointed out. You have this convergence zone and then it's sinking. And so if you just look at the surface domain, what's happening is it's, it's like you're removing uh, water from the, from the surface. And so you can think of these uh, Gary, as sinks. Gary, yeah. let me stop you. There's a, a question. I don't know, Claudio, you want to uh, uh, read it yourself? There's no, a question for you. I can't see the, uh, the chat. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I was just uh, curious if this, the model that you were using before in the, in the previous slide is known to be mixing. Uh, no. So the well, question basically is, are, uh, after a long time, are we looking at invariant density or the second uh, eigenfunction? I think, I, I think I'm going to address this in a couple of slides. Um, but uh, here you have, you have the problem that uh, you have an, it, it's an open, it's an open dynamical system. So you have mass that is leaving through these sinks. Um, numerically, you get just, uh, numerically the top eigenvalue is, um, uh, is, is, you just get one one. So in that sense, it's mixing. But um, as for the model itself, we didn't really do anything more sophisticated to try to determine mixing this. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, please feel free to ask questions along the way, anyone else? Um, so yeah, this is a deterministic dynamics point of view. If I translate this to uh, a Markov chain point of view, what we're asking about are uh, absorption probabilities to absorbing sets. So the sinks are the absorbing sets and the basins of attraction can be characterized by the absorption probabilities. So in an ideal setting where you have K distinct attracting sets and they have distinct uh, basins of attraction, uh, then what you would expect is that um, the transition matrix has K eigenvalues one. So one has multiplicity K and you can find a basis of a k-dimensional basis of eigenvectors that looks like the following. So the, the ith entry of the kth vector is one if the ith state or the ith box, if you like, belongs to the kth attracting set. It's zero if i doesn't belong to the kth attracting set and is not even in the basin of attraction of the kth attracting set. And then for all other possibilities, you have uh, PIK, which is the absorption probability for state I into AK. Now, here we're talking about the ocean, not an, ide not an idealized setting. So what you find numerically is you don't get all these ones, 
you get uh, a one followed by a bunch of eigenvalues that are nearby one. And the, the k-dimensional eigenspace that you would get associated to, to the ones, that also is perturbed. So you can, you can argue with perturbation theory to say, well, okay, I, I have the, what I have is a perturbation of the idealized setting. Now, a, a bit of a problem with this is that when you, of course, you just perturb the eigenspace, you don't, uh, you don't perturb the individual basis vectors. So when you actually compute the eigenvectors, you don't get this, uh, you don't get this one zero structure or mostly one zero structure what you get is the leading eigenvector being constant. Okay, I'm talking about right eigenvectors, adjoint eigenvectors here. So you get a constant by integral preservation. And then you get uh, the sine vectors, but I mean, we want something like this. So let's say red is one, blue is zero. This is, this is perfect. But you also get mixed up things like this. But it's not all bad because you can imagine if you have vectors that are mostly zero and one and you take a linear combination of them, then you can, you're going to have some level set structure that, that you'll be able to see. And indeed, if you look at this, you say, well, I have this big level set of blue, a big level set of red, yellow here. So you can actually by hand, uh, in fact, these are the basins of attraction. So here's one, here's one, here's one. You can by hand, and that's what we did for this paper. I by hand uh, figured out what the boundaries are. Uh, but what I want to show you here is an automatic way, which is much, much nicer, I wish I had it back then. Uh, to, to automatically give us this canonical basis. So what we would like is what we get when we do the computation of eigenvectors is what's on the left. What we would like to have is what's on the right. So on the right, uh, you see that this is in red, this is the basin of attraction for the South Pacific garbage patch. So anything start, any, if you're initialized over here, you will flow eastwards and get sucked into the, this, this patch here. Uh, similarly, if you're starting here, you get uh, you flow eastwards and get sucked into the South Atlantic patch. Uh, North Pacific is pretty, as you expect, um, and so on. And so what we're doing here is we're applying a rotation matrix, a five by five rotation matrix, to rotate this basis into a sparse basis. And the reason I want a sparse basis is because I want to have one feature, one basin per vector. And so I want to have a bunch of ones and then the rest zero. And if I can do that, this will be as sparse as I can get. So we use this algorithm called sparse eigenbasis approximation or SIBA. Um, I have a slide on this, but I'm not going to go through it here because it's not really anything to do with the ocean, but it's on the slide if you want to have a look and there is code on my, my webpage. It's, the algorithm is not particularly uh, difficult. So once you have these separated uh, uh, basins, you can then uh, effectively just add them up. And, and so in one picture now, we have all the basins. And um, yeah, you see some interesting things, in particular where the boundaries are. So the, the blue is where you're not sure what's going to happen. So if you are flowing along here, depending on whether you're just a little uh, south of Perth or a little north of Perth, if you're a little south, you go over here into the South Pacific patch, if you're a little north, you go up into the Indian patch. Similarly, if you're just a little south of the tip of South Africa, you go into the Indian patch. If you're a little north, you recirculate back, come out the other side into the South Atlantic. So uh, I think this is very nice. It gives you very I mean, reasonably precise boundaries of, of uh, the basins of attraction for these patches. Some of them are what you expect, like the equatorial boundary in the Pacific, but others are not really what you expect or see in, uh, see in books, oceanography books for, for ocean boundaries. All right, so um, how am I doing for time? Uh, okay, so this brings me to my last uh, question. So I want to do now something that's similar to what I did with the Antarctic Giants. I want to look for objects that are not leaking or not interacting with the surrounding water. But now I want to let them move. So with the gyres, they, around the Antarctic, they really do just sit there pretty much. They, they move a little bit, but not so much. Things like ocean eddies are really moving a lot. And uh, so these are, these are eddies off the coast of South Africa, the, the gray ones. And um, just to show you that uh, 
that not all, you know, if I, if I put a, a disc here, that not all discs are behaving so nicely, the blue disc, you can, we just randomly threw down. So the gray discs were computed carefully. The blue one we just randomly placed and you see the blue one is very rapidly mixed in the flow. But if you, if you very carefully choose these discs, then they stay like discs. So this is an experiment that, that's uh, based off satellite altimetry. Uh, okay, so let me explain what I, what I did there. So I'm arguing that coherent transport in the domain is equivalent to slow mixing. You have these objects that are remaining coherent. They're not incoherent like the blue object. And the reason they're coherent is because you don't have much mixing inside the eddy to outside the eddy. And you can again use the transfer operator to define a sequence of signed mass distributions that mix most slowly over some finite time we're interested in. So the idea is similar to what I discussed at the beginning of the talk. We take some initial, well, what we're doing is we're looking for some F, we're looking for some signed distribution of mass. We hit it with our transfer operator and it's going to decay in norm, but we want it to decay as little as possible. So we want to find the lambda that is as close to one as possible. And you can pose this as an optimization problem. And uh, it turns out, again, it's not super difficult. It turns out that the, the optimal values for this problem are the singular values of your, of your transfer operator and the corresponding F that you should choose, the ones that are going to tell us where the, these coherent objects are, these are the corresponding singular vectors. In particular, the lambda two tells you how much decay has occurred, what is the slowest decay that can occur over this finite time interval. Now you can implement this uh, in, in, in various ways, but I'm going to stick first with the, with the box, the, the grid idea. Uh, so uh, very quickly, because I want to move on to another uh, related approach, which I think is superior. Um, what I'm doing here is I want to identify a single eddy. So what I do is in 3D, I put a box around this eddy. I, I have a rough idea where it is from sea surface height. And um, I compute my transition matrix over a six month period. So I'm using this Orca model again. Here are the details on how many boxes I have and how many test points per box and I flow for six months. And I make my transition matrix. And then I compute a singular vector, which is three dimensional in phase space. This is the top view. This is looking down on the surface. And so the red is, uh, the, red is the eddy I want. And again, I cut away through a level set. I cut away the, uh, the part of the ocean and I choose this level set so my object is least leaky. And what I get is this 3D object here. So this is my eddy in, at May at the initial time. And then I flow for six months and most of the water goes here, but you have this, some water leaks out and that's what this cloud is here. Okay. All right, um, so now I want to, um, Marco, you have to tell me, or someone has to tell me if I'm, uh, how much time do I have left? You have 15 minutes, a little 15. more. Oh, oh, this is plenty, okay. Um, all right, so uh, now I, I guess I'm switching gears a little bit. Uh, so far I've been talking about uh, the probability ideas. I have my transfer operator, I'm talking about leaking, um, and I'm doing everything in terms of probability to leak and expectations of escape times and so on. Now I want to think a bit more about geometry. So here is a geometric picture. Here I have some 2D object given with boundary given by this black uh, uh, ellipse. And it gets evolved deterministically as you see here in this cartoon. And I have a small amount of uh, noise and that's indicated by the gray blur uh, or fuzz around the, the boundary. Now, if I have a point inside, inside my ellipse, the only way it can, it, it cannot get out it cannot mix outside the ellipse just by advection because, well, your flow map is continuous. There's no way a point inside can get outside just by evolving according to a flow. The only way it can get outside is by diffusion kicking it outside. 
So the amount of mixing that occurs from here to here is proportional to the total area of the gray that you see. So the wider the gray, the more chance that you will mix. And it's this total area that's minimized by the singular vectors of the transfer operator. That, that, that's not obvious, but um, I'm just telling you that this is, this is underlying how, how the, the singular vectors work. So now, what if I shrink this, this noise to zero? What if, I, what if I make my flow pure advection? So if you squeeze this band from something fat to something thin, what does the total area correspond to? Well, now what you're really interested in is the, the, the total or the average length of the boundary. So it's the length of the boundary or the interface that determines the amount of mixing in this deterministic limit. And so we can pose this equivalently, this, this how do I find a slow mixing set problem. We can pose this geometrically. We can say we want to find objects whose interfaces remain persistently short as they evolve under the flow. And we can actually do this formally with, with the operators. So um, I'm taking this limit epsilon goes to zero, epsilon is my noise level. Uh, you can do this formally. So for the moment, just look at the P and the P star. So suppose, um, okay, let me, let me backtrack. So I was, I was talking about singular vectors of P, okay? That is, that's obviously the same as eigenvectors of P times P adjoint. So now suppose I take this product and I let uh, epsilon go to zero. So what would happen in this limit is I would be deterministically pushed forward by, by P, but the adjoint would in the limit just be the inverse. And so that would pull me back. And so this product would just in the limit be the identity transformation or the identity operator. So that tells me nothing about the dynamics. So you have to go to higher order terms. So you subtract the identity and then you rescale by epsilon squared. And then you can take this limit and then you get something interesting and, and non-trivial. So you get the Laplace operator, plus you get this, uh, this Laplace operator for, for the pullback of the Euclidean metric from the, from the endpoint. So what you are doing here is you, you put in some F, this F is living on your initial manifold. You push, you push that F forward with the, with the flow. You apply Laplace in the future. So it feels the distortion from the nonlinear flow. And then you pull the result back. So you, you end up with a function that's on your original uh, space. So this is a perfectly good elliptic symmetric operator. It has all the nice spectral properties of, of a Laplace. And um, by this argument, uh, the eigenvectors of this dynamic Laplace operator, so I've got this D for dynamic here, superscript, these eigenvectors correspond to the singular vectors of the, of the transfer operator. So the two approaches are really doing the same thing uh, for very small epsilon. So we can now look at eigenfunctions of this dynamic Laplace operator to solve this, uh, this problem of how do you find sets that have persistently smallest interface. And, and this is really an, a type of isoparametric problem, but now we are extending this isoparametric idea to, to general nonlinear dynamics. Yeah, okay. I mean, in practice, you wouldn't just do uh, this, uh, this sort of initial time and final time, you would, you would do an integral. And, and that, is what I'm, uh, that is what I'll describe now. So uh, let me look at the ocean, okay? So um, again, we have this operator. If we want to do anything in the ocean, we need to numerically approximate it. And if you know anything about uh, Laplace operators, the, the numerical approximation, you know that finite elements are a nice way to, to, to do things. So in this paper, we, we specialized, we made a special finite element method to approximate this operator. And how we intend to apply it is using several traje many trajectories. And um, all we're going to need is the position of trajectories. So for example, in this, in this movie, uh, maybe you can see lots of little blue dots moving around. So these are, these are floats, each one of these is a float. Uh, they're pretty expensive. They used to be a million dollars each. I don't know how much they are these days, maybe they're a bit cheaper. Uh, and uh, we're going to build a mesh from these, uh, from these floats. So let me, uh, let me just tell you a bit about what these are doing. So uh, the floats will, they're called Argo floats. So they uh, descend to uh, a thousand meters and then they drift around there for nine days. Uh, and then for the last day, 
they, they go down to 2,000 meters quickly, then they pop up to the surface, they tell the satellite where they are, they tell them all the data they collected, the temperature, the salinity, and so on, and, uh, and then they repeat. So most of the time, 90% of the time, they're at this 1,000 meter level, and we are going to assume that they represent motion uh, at the 1,000 meter level. level. Now, there's about 3,000 of these. The fleet is gradually increasing over time. So this is how many you have versus uh, time. In the experiment, we looked at a six-year flow time. And over those six years, 90% uh, of the floats don't last that long. So what happens is the battery runs out or they, they hit the coasts, they get beached, uh, or, they, or something else goes wrong. And they have to be picked up and they're removed from the data set. And at the same time, ships are bringing out new floats to, to replenish the old ones. So uh, most of them, the vast bulk of them, don't last the six years. You have this continual turnover of floats. But this is not really uh, a problem for us because what we're going to do is simply mesh at each uh, month. So we have six years, 72 months. We simply mesh uh, the positions of the floats at each month. And we're going to use that information to build this dynamic Laplace operator. So the strategy is you construct the dynamic Laplacian using these meshes, you compute the leading eigenfunctions. Um, in these eigenfunctions, you'll have these slow mixing objects, but they'll be all mixed up as you saw with the garbage patches. So we're going to separate them using the sparse eigenbasis approximation, and then we combine them all into one picture as I did for the, for the basins of attraction. And this is, this is what you get. So um, these are a very large ocean basin scale. So red means, uh, red is an object that is remaining non-mixing at this very large scale. And um, many of these are kind of in uh, positions that, that oceanographers would not be too surprised about given the mean flow of the surface ocean. Maybe this is a little more convincing. So it's the same picture, but uh, I'm, I've now got it at the float level. So each float has been painted some color. The color remains the same throughout the movie. And what you should see is that the, the red floats kind of just move around in their own red set and they don't escape. So you can see, uh, for example, here, there's a lot of motion going on inside uh, the collection of red floats, but, but the red is not leaving and going uh, over here, for example. Okay. So then uh, this is my last example. I'm going to, this was very large scale. This is global scale and the objects are ocean basin scale. Uh, let me uh, scale down a little bit. So now I'm going to look at a piece of the North Atlantic Ocean. And here you have uh, uh, several different um, slow mixing features. So one of them, one of these persistent features is the Gulf Stream that you see here. Uh, and these, lots of these little rings, which are ocean eddies. So we're going to try and detect both of these thing, things using this uh, idea of slow mixing. So the information we use is trajectories in this, uh, in this square. So to orient you, this is um, Newfoundland, this is Nova Scotia, New York is down here. And this is a 90 day flow. So this is using satellite, um, the velocity field is inferred from uh, satellites telling you the height of the ocean from SSH data. And uh, Arena Rapino from Woods Hole uh, kindly sent me the uh, trajectories. So in this, in this uh, cloud of points, we are looking for slow mixing structures. So we, we mesh, we do all the meshing, we construct this dynamic Laplace operator. And what you're looking at here is the second eigenfunction. So the, the first non-trivial eigenfunction of that operator. And again, what I'm doing is painting a particle with a color according to the eigenfunction value. So red is plus one, blue is minus one, and I don't change the color throughout the movie. So what you see is there's this interface between the blue and the red, and that interface is remaining pretty short throughout the flow time. The, I mean, there's some complicated flow going on, the interface meanders, but it doesn't really get too long. And this interface is very strongly correlated with the Gulf Stream. It's, it's essentially where the, it's, it is essentially the Gulf Stream. So what we have is a purely kinematic from the motion of the particles diagnosis of the position of the Gulf Stream. And so what that means is you have, for example, warm water here in the red, cold water in the blue, 
And because this interface remains short, the, the warm water is kept mostly away from cold water and you get this sharp temperature gradient across the Gulf Stream. If we compute many more eigenvectors, not just the second one, but many, many more, and then we combine them using, using SIBA, uh, then we can get smaller scale features like these eddies. So the red here, uh, each one of these red things is, is an ocean eddy. Each little particle does not change color. So if the particles are red, they remain inside the eddy, even though the eddy moves around and rotates, they remain inside the eddy. So each eddy is like a little disconnected piece of the ocean that doesn't mix with the, with the surrounding water. So each one of these are coherent transporters of water, heat and whatever. Okay, so that's, uh, that's my talk. Uh, so let me just uh, summarize what we looked at. So question one, we have these four questions. Question one was how do we find fixed in space uh, parts of the ocean that are minimally leaky? So these are finite time, almost invariant sets. And we looked at uh, and characterizing Antarctic gyres in this way. So there you should find the, uh, the leading right eigenvectors of this transfer operator, this symmetrized transfer operator. Then we looked at escape time fields from the gyres. And for that, we, we solved this, uh, this linear system. Then with the plastic uh, garbage patches, we looked at what are the pathways into these garbage patches? What are the basins of attraction? And we should get, we should look at the right eigenvectors of the transfer operator in that case. And the last part of the talk was about how you find moving mobile uh, minimally leaking regions or finite time coherent sets. And so these represent things like Agulis rings, uh, which are ocean eddies. Uh, we have these large basin scale objects uh, and we have the Gulf Stream. And so you can either compute singular vectors of the transfer operator or you can compute leading eigenvectors of this dynamic Laplace operator. Um, so those are the references and uh, let me thank my funders and of course all my collaborators who are extremely important to all of this. I've really learned a lot from them, a lot, particularly about the ocean. So uh, thank you to them and thank you to all of you for, for listening. And um, thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, talk. Uh, very interesting, really. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I have, a question, I have a question, please. I have a question, please. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this nice talk. Uh, talking about uh, long, long time dynamics, uh, you have mentioned something related to attractions and convergence to an eigenvalue. Uh, are we talking here about the theory of attractors? I mean, uh, compact set that absorbs the trajectories of the dynamical systems? And if yes, what kind of factors we are talking about here? Is there any like exponential or global attractors or something like that? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll try and answer it. Um, so, okay, yeah, here I was talking about uh, these, uh, I think this is what you mean. Uh, I have these convergent zones. Yes, yes. Um, so, so what I've done here is take the notion model, which, which I guess is essentially a deterministic dynamical system and then I've converted it into this Markov chain in order to do the computations. So maybe your question is about the original model. So for the original model, it has, it has a velocity field. It's a, it's a continuous time deterministic dynamical system. And you could ask questions about basins of attraction for that, for that continuous space, continuous time model. Um, so that is, that is not exactly what I did. I'm trying to, I'm approximating that by, by discretizing in space. Uh, but uh, you could, by other methods, uh, take the model, the ocean model, which is deterministic, and you could apply um, whatever method you like um, to, to determine the basins of attraction. Maybe they're, maybe they're more complicated than my discretization shows. Maybe they are, there is some intermingling that I'm, uh, that I'm missing with my discretization, but in principle, that is something you could do. Okay, so can, 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 uh, can we calculate some rate of attractions, uh, even if you, in your methods in, after applying discretization for the model? Yes, uh, so rate of attraction to the 
to the, in phase space, you mean, or in the... to, to this edge? To this, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, after some time, uh, like, uh, is it is it somehow fast attractions to the first, or uh, can we see slow attractions, or the, uh, in the global question, is it uh, what we can see about the rate of attractions here? Right. Um, so the the eigenvalues that I get, they are telling me about, um, yeah, so these eigenvalues, they are telling me about um, rates of decay of the eigenfunctions of the transfer operator. So how that, how that converts to rates of attraction in the phase space is not completely obvious, uh, if that's what you mean. So uh, I don't know if I have a good, uh, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, I, I can tell you something about if you were to, if you were to throw rubbish in a certain distribution in the ocean, uh, I could tell you about the rate of attract, the rate of convergence of that distribution, initial distribution of garbage to uh, something like a conditional invariant density associated with one of the attracting sets. I could, I could tell you something about that at a functional level, uh, but in phase, but I can't really, I can't say so much about what is happening in phase space. I mean, rates, rates in phase space. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? I have also a question. Uh, your simulation are performed in a stationary condition or you are also considering, for example, a periodic uh, perturbed system or a system which is changing in time, also adiabatically. So, I mean, it, in your, for, for example, in such a case, you can have a bifurcation phenomena in the spectrum or something like that. Do you consider this case or your theory apply only in a stationary situation? It's, uh, so the first three questions are essentially in the stationary situation. And the fourth situation, that is in the time-dependent situation. So yeah, my first, my, you know, uh, what I'm doing here is uh, I'm looking at uh, things that are fixed in space. So uh, if I talk about, uh, if I talk about, anytime I talk about eigen vectors of this operator, then, I, oh, did I lose my? Yeah, we lost the, sh the shared screen. Can you? Uh, uh, because he, my acrobat died. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, was on for a while. Okay. Now, now, you, now you see it again. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah. So um, the short answer, I guess, is that questions questions one, two, and three are, are for stationary dynamics. And question four is deliberately designed for non-stationary dynamics. So when you want, and that this is the spatially mobile aspect. So when you're looking at, um, when you're looking at, let's see, does end work? Yes, okay. Um, when you're looking at things that are moving like this, then this is something that is clearly, I think, not, uh, well, this is not stationary. If you, if you want to have, if you want to have motion that is from, east to west, then that, that's not stationary. So this, this last part of the talk where I showed these kind of pictures, this is for non-stationary systems, but the earliest material is for stationary systems. That's the short answer. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have a short one myself, well, hopefully it's short. Um, when you were describing the, the uh, transfer operator approach to garbage, um, at some point, you actually mentioned that, you know, that the problem is really three-dimensional, but plastic doesn't dive down the ocean and then just floats on the surface of the ocean. So mm -hmm. is that uh, a specific remark to, to explain how you actually do it? Because I would, I would expect your problem to be uh, two-dimensional, and then you, you would do that approximation without any depth in the ocean. But then you mentioned this, and then I got curious, 
how do you separate you know the mass that is not supposed to go down from from water that that can actually flow down yeah this is this is an interesting point uh, so uh, you have you have the surface uh, you have boxes on the surface and uh, in, in three dimensions, if you, if you made a three-dimensional grid, then the surface boxes would actually lose mass because it would actually descend and leave the surface boxes. But when you look at it, when you have a two-dimensional domain, you, what you see instead is accumulation. At, you, you, don't see the, you don't see the leaving below because you only have two dimensions. Okay. So, so um, uh, the way we set it up with the, with the, the two-dimensional domain is these are really absorbing sets rather okay. than... So it is, yeah. I mean, mathematically speaking, it is a two-dimensional grid. That's all I wanted it's to a, say. It, it oh. is exactly a two-dimensional grid. Oh, okay. The, I th at some point, I thought you were, mentioning, you were mentioning three dimensions. I didn't know if three dimensions were built into the model, and then you'd separated garbage from water in some way and I asked I was asking you about that no, or you were uh, just making a remark that physics is not like that but we approximate this as a sink I, I think I was just trying to explain why the okay. like the, conund the conundrum between water being incompressible and and oh yeah like, okay no totally <laughs> okay no no that's, that's, that's clear to that's me. Cool. yeah you, you can actually infer you can make pick, you can make maps of downwelling and upwelling uh, with this accumulation process, and they match they match pretty well what oceanographers know about the upwelling and downwelling. All right. It's very clear now. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I say we give uh, one last virtual round of applause to to Gary for this very 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 interesting talk, and uh, mm -hmm. I guess. Uh, um, I'll see you, you all at the next uh, event, at the next, next seminar, which is going to be uh, seven days from now.